Good morning and welcome to Lilydale Church. It is lovely to have you with us. Today we are going to take a journey to Caesarea. Paul has been in prison. There's been a, a midnight dash from Jerusalem down to or up to Caesarea. And now Paul finds himself there waiting. It's a relatively pleasant place if you're going to be in prison. But here Paul is confronted by three rich and powerful men in succession. Men who will do anything to get what they want and to maintain their power. And so as the story unfolds, even though Paul is the one in prison here, look behind the scenes of what's happening because in fact spiritually it is these three rich and powerful men that are really imprisoned by their choices and Paul seeks to draw them out as he speaks truth to power. First though, Caesarea. Caesarea, you know, I want you to imagine if you like a sandy beach, you're walking along the beach, kicking the sand between your toes. There's a gentle breeze. The waters of the Mediterranean lapping onto the sand. It is beautiful, warm, relaxed. That's Caesarea. Caesarea was one of the, the beautiful cities. It had been built by Herod the Great. It was finished a couple of, well, a decade, maybe two decades, somewhere in there before Jesus was born. So it's a relatively new city. It's planned. It's beautiful. Um, it was at that time the biggest man-made seaport in the world. Um, it really was an impressive structure. So as this, this harbour um, structure city is there by the seaside, we see a city that has Herod's palace. Now Herod's palace was quite something. It was right on the waterfront. You know, literally water lapping at its walls. And, and it was probably in Herod's palace that Paul was, was put in prison. So as, as they are there, you've got temples, you've got a, an amazing amphitheater. This amphitheater seats something like 4,000 people. It's made of stone and marble. You can still go there today. It looks west, out over the Mediterranean, and so imagine, if you will, sitting in the theatre, you know, of a, of the, in the cool of a morning when they would have their plays, looking out over the Mediterranean as your backdrop, gentle sea breezes. It would have been just something spectacular. And even today, this amphitheatre in Caesarea is, is a sought after venue for events today. They still hold concerts there. So this is the city in which there was also, along the waterfront, a, a hippodrome uh, where they did their horse racing and, and all that type of thing. Um, they've got public bars. Anything you want is there. It's clean. It's beautiful. Compared to Jerusalem, the Romans far preferred to stay in Caesarea because in Caesarea you'd get the sea breezes. Um, it was a safe city. Jerusalem was crammed in on a hill, inland, hot, um, and so people like Pilate and any of the other um, Roman rulers preferred to be at Caesarea. So Caesarea is the place that Philip, the deacon, the evangelist, brings Christianity to the city. He ends up living there for, for many years. And when Paul passes through, which he does on a number of occasions, um, on his last journey or his his journey last to this one through Caesarea. He actually stays in the house of Philip for a few days. And the, the thing that we note there is that Philip has four unmarried daughters who prophesy. That's, that's their claim to fame. So they're obviously well known. It's also the city uh, where Agabus, who was also a prophet, prophesies of what would happen to Paul in future. And it also happens to be the city where Cornelius becomes a Christian and Peter baptizes him there. So this is, this is, you know, the beautiful Mediterranean city that was Caesarea. And so enter Governor Felix. Governor Felix, his full title, Marcus Antonius Felix, 
he rules as governor from about 52 through to about 59 AD. And there's a few things we need to know about Felix. Luke is actually reasonably kind in his portrayal of Felix, but he's actually kinder than pretty much everyone else. You, you read from the ancient writers and what we learn is a Felix who was violent, cruel, power hungry and quite happy to shed blood. He'd been appointed by Emperor Claudius. He was actually a favourite of, of Emperor, Emperor Claudius. And what's unusual about this is that Felix was a freed slave. Now, that wasn't unusual in the Roman Empire. But what was unusual was for a freed slave to be appointed as a governor. And so both Felix and his brother Pallas were freed slaves, favourites of the emperor, and it meant that Felix felt like he could do pretty much anything. And if that meant making false promises of safe passage to an Egyptian who had led a revolt against Rome at one stage, well, he was happy to do it. And in fact, that happened on one occasion. He made false promises of safe passage through the desert, sent his soldiers out, slaughtered about 400 of them because that's what Governor Felix did. He's also the guy that engineers assassinations in broad daylight. He goes to the Sicarii, the, I guess the Romans would have seen them as terrorists, pays them off and gets them to kill on one occasion Jonathan the high priest and on other occasions others in broad daylight in Jerusalem. So he is this unsavory character. You would not trust him as far as you could kick him. He has a, a very beautiful wife by reputation, Drusilla, and it's a bit of a tangled web on this wife front. Um, it's not the only wife he has along the way. On one occasion, I think it's a little later, he marries the granddaughter of Antony and Cleopatra. Um, but Drusilla she is first married at age 14 to a minor Syrian king. At age 20, Felix comes along and convinces her to leave him and marry him. Um, and so at 20, Felix and Drusilla get together. They have a son together, actually. And just a, an interesting aside as much as anything, this son dies in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, that eruption that destroyed... Um, Pompeii in 79 AD and their son dies in that eruption. So this is, this is Felix. You know, he is a repulsive character in every way. And so here in, in Acts 24, this is where we enter into the introductory speech, if you like. Now, we come across a guy by the name of Tertullus. Tertullus, Tertullus, how we... We decided when we looked at this recently in our, in, in our teens Bible study group that Tertullus actually sounds like his name is, is a teenage mutant ninja turtle. But anyway, that's, I just had to slip that in. So Tertullus tries to ingratiate himself to Felix. And this is what he says. We have enjoyed, he says, a long period of peace under you and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation everywhere and in every way most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude, but in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. You know, the man is a crawler. This is, this is the Jewish lawyer sucking up, if I can put it in those terms, to this governor that they all hate with a passion but tell him how wonderful and magnificent he is and how kind. It, it's just an utter load of rubbish. It's an interesting contrast because Paul in Acts chapter 24, verse 10, quite a different approach. When it comes time for him to speak to the governor, he's the one that just says it as it is. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for many years or for a number of years, you have been a judge over this nation so I gladly make my, my defence. Paul here is straight to the point, speaks the truth, doesn't try to say something that is rubbish and therefore discredit himself. 
Now, the accusations that Tertullus and the Jews have made against Paul, they are flimsy at best. And so when Paul makes his defence, and we're not going to read through it all, but I'd encourage you to read through these chapters after, if you haven't already, Acts 24, 25, 26. When Paul makes his defence, it's a pretty compelling defence. And he goes through... The, the four key charges that they have made against him. So the first thing that Paul comes out with is to say, look, there are no witnesses against me for these alleged crimes. All it is is Tertullus and the Jewish leaders. The witnesses that should have been there if it was a legitimate case, just they're not there. They, they either haven't been willing to come or they've gone home or whatever it is. And it really meant there was no basis for any charge against Paul. And the whole thing should have been tossed out at that point. The second thing that Paul defends himself against is that he's disturbed the peace. And so what he basically says is, look, I've not disturbed the peace. I've not done anything that's caused a problem. In fact, and, and this is now very much addressed to Felix, if you look at what Lysias or Lysias, the, the commander from Jerusalem, has written, it wasn't me that caused the trouble, it was the Jews. It was the Jews who planned to assassinate him. Um, that, that's Paul. And, and Lysias actually writes that it is him, you know, the, the, the Roman hero that rescues Paul from the violence of the Jews. So Paul says, look, not my problem. The third thing that Paul defends against is this sense that he's been accused of desecrating the temple. And, and his defense is really simple on this one. And that is, look, I agree with everything written in the scripture. I go to the temple to worship. How is that desecrating it? I wouldn't bring someone in like they've accused me of. And then the fourth defense he makes is that, look, how can the Jews accuse me here in a Roman court when the Sanhedrin itself, you know, the Jewish ruling council have not found me guilty. And again, if we remember back in the story, we remember that Paul has spoken to the Sanhedrin about the resurrection of the dead and the Sanhedrin just descends into chaos because they're arguing the pros and cons of the resurrection of the dead. And Paul's whole point here is, look, it was an argument about the resurrection of the dead, but there was no adverse finding against him. And so at this point, we come to Acts chapter 24 and verse 22. Because here we see how Felix responds. And in Acts chapter 24 and verse 22, it says, Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. Done. But it raises a really interesting question. So here's this corrupt governor in Felix. He hears the accusations and Paul, Paul's defense and then says, right, we're, we're done. But we, we have this insight. Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, with Christians, with Christianity. How does Felix know about the way? Now, is it his wife? Because we discover in a moment that his wife is actually you know, a Jewish background, or we knew that already, but it's spelled out for us in a moment in Acts chapter 24. Um, but is there someone in his household that has become a Christian? Or is he just curious? Whatever the case, it's an interesting little piece of the puzzle. So now we come to Acts chapter 24 and verses 24 to 26. Acts 24, 24. And it says, Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. So this is after all the events, the, the, the trial as such. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Notice that Paul gets to talk to this corrupt guy about faith in Christ Jesus. This is the moment that Paul lives for. And it says, as Paul talked with Felix and Drusilla about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave when I find it convenient. I will send for you. I want you to notice the three things. Righteousness, which is the opposite of anything that Felix was. Self-control, 
which Felix has none of, and the judgment to come, which Felix is going to have to answer to. Paul is speaking truth to a man of power in a way that hits right at the heart. You know, this, this is amazing stuff when you think about it. And so as Paul does this, we see that it moves Felix's heart, but it moves him to fear, but not to, and not enough to change. It's not the last time this happens. And then we come to verse 26, because we, we get to see into the heart of Felix again. It says at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, because if Paul gives him money, he can let him go. And he gets a bit richer in the process. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Now for poor old Paul, he ends up stuck here in Caesarea. As we say, not a bad place to be in prison. But he ends up stuck here in Caesarea for two years. Felix is kind of stuck. On the one hand, he doesn't want to let Paul go because he'd like a bribe. Um... But if he lets him go, it's undermining his relationship with the Jewish leaders and he doesn't want to do that. But he knows really what he should do. So two years tick past and, well, he moves on. And in his stead comes another governor, Governor Festus. Or if we go by his full title, Governor Porcius Festus. And Festus really is the good guy in this story. Um, well, let me say, that's probably a comparative thing. He's better than Felix. He's not quite as corrupt. He's not quite as, um, yeah, bloodthirsty and all that goes with that. But he's not been in Israel long. Essentially, he's turned up and he's confronted with Paul sitting in prison waiting for justice. And, and Festus actually doesn't live very long. He only survives for two years and after his two years in Caesarea, he dies or at the end of his two years, um, he's done. But he, but he does seem to want to expedite this issue with Paul and achieve some sort of justice with it. But he's got the same predicament that Felix has. So their, their predicament is free Paul and be just and anger the Jewish leaders or hand him over to the Jewish leaders and be totally unjust or just do nothing and leave him sitting in prison and the Jewish leaders aren't terribly unhappy and Paul, well, he doesn't have a choice in it, he's just got to wait. And so as Festus deals with this matter, he brings Paul before him. And it's, it's an abbreviated account this time. And so in Acts chapter 25 and verse 8, we just see a little of Paul's defense. It says, then Paul made his defense. And it goes like this. I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Done. Now, he says a little bit more than that. But essentially, we just get from Luke a summary of his defense, which probably was very similar to what he said to, to Felix. Now, in the background of this, there's still an assassination plot bubbling against Paul two years past the original assassination plot against him. And so when Felix says to him, Paul, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to take this up to Jerusalem and have you tried in Jerusalem, Paul's response at that point is very clear. He feels that he can receive justice at the hands of the Romans more than he's going to achieve it at the hands of the Jews. And so in Acts chapter 25 verse 11 you get these brief words and Paul says I appeal to Caesar and as a Roman citizen he had that right. And so in verse 12 it says after Festus had conferred with his council he declared you've appealed to Caesar to Caesar you will go. That was Paul's right. And so you know, Paul is now inexorably heading for Rome. It's, it's a smart move, though, because now Agrippa turns up in town. 
And we, we now get introduced to a new one. And it's actually a smart move on the part of Festus to bring a gripper into this situation. And I'll explain that in a minute. But why does Paul appeal to Caesar? Well, let's talk a gripper first, actually. Agrippa, his full name was Marcus Julius Agrippa. We know him as Herod Agrippa II. So his father was Herod Agrippa I and his great-grandfather was Herod the Great. So there's this long line of pretty corrupt kings. They are Jewish. Um, Agrippa's situation is an interesting one. Officially, he never marry, marries, but he has a sister, um, Bernice or Berenice, and she had previously been married. Bernice is the sister of Drusilla. Remember, Drusilla is married to Felix. So you've got Drusilla, you've got Berenice, and you have Herod Agrippa the second, sisters, brothers together. Now, the scuttlebutt on this one is a bit, um, <laughs> a bit hard to be believed, but the, the scuttlebutt was pretty much accepted, and that was that Berenice, twice married already, um, was Herod Agrippa's consort. And that means exactly what you think it means. And so as the rumours spread about Agrippa and his sister being together in more ways than they should, um, she goes and marries a third time. That doesn't last and she comes back into the palace with Agrippa where she lives for quite some time. And so it was, anyway, that was the scuttlebutt on him. But later, later on, she ends up leaving and goes to Rome, ends up as the mistress of Titus, of, of all things, who becomes emperor. Anyway, so Agrippa is raised in Rome, but he's Jewish. So he's a friend to Emperor Claudius and Titus. His, his loyalty to Rome trumps his Jewish identity when it comes to the crunch. He was custodian of the temple treasure, which meant he got to appoint the high priest which must have been interesting conversations when Felix had one of them assassinated. Um, he is knowledgeable about things Jewish. And, and the records actually tell us that he was known for even debating points of scriptural law with the rabbis. But when revolution came down the track to, to Israel and Rome crushed them, he knew which side his bread was buttered on and he was loyal to Rome and was handsomely rewarded for it. And so now we come to the scene where Herod Agrippa enters um, Festus and, you know, in comes Paul. And I want you to imagine again what it must have been like there, um, you know, probably in Herod's palace by the sea, big, tall, smooth Roman columns, uh, mosaics on the floor, the Mediterranean lapping on the walls, um, you know, gentle sea breeze coming through, spectacular. Um, it would have been quite something. So there, there would have been soldiers in all their regalia, um, the red Roman robes, the purple royal robes, and, and all of that. In the book Acts of the Apostles, it gives us a, a bit of a, it paints a word picture. I just want to read it to you. It says, In honour of his visitors, Festus had sought to make this an occasion of, an, of imposing display. The rich robes of the procurator and his guests, the swords of the soldiers and the gleaming army of their commanders lent brilliancy to the scene. And now Paul, still manacled, chained, stood before the assembled company. What a contrast was here presented. Agrippa and Bernice possessed power and position, and because of this, they were favoured by the world. But they were destitute of the traits of character that God esteems. They were transgressors of his law, corrupt at heart and life. Their course of action was abhorred by heaven. The aged prisoner, Paul, chained to his soldier guard, had in his appearance nothing that would lead the world to pay him homage. 
Yet in this man, apparently without friends or wealth or position and held prisoner for his faith in God, all heaven was interested. Angels were his attendants. Had the glory of one of those shining messengers flashed forth, the pomp and pride of royalty which was on display would have paled. Kings and courtiers would have been stricken to the earth, as were the Roman guards at the sepulchre of Christ. And she continues with the the story. But Paul here, you, you, you can just picture it. You know, Paul by now is getting on in life. He's, he's getting older. And his defense, as you read through the detail of it, which we, we won't do together now, but there in Acts chapter 26, there's quite some detail that he goes to. This is the third time In the book of Acts that Paul gives his testimony, tells his story, tells his story of Jesus. And so here he gives his testimony. You've got Festus, you've got Agrippa and Berenice sitting there in all their power and glory and wealth. And his testimony is a simple one. It's a testimony of a proud persecutor of Christians confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. It's the the testimony of one who has become a humble servant of Jesus. And as he speaks, he sees that Agrippa is moved by his story, is moved by his words, but he's not changed. Like Felix, who is moved but not changed, so Agrippa is moved but not changed. It is almost but not enough. And Agrippa becomes the last, the last of the line of Herod. He has no children. He has no heir. And though he goes on to rule to anywhere from 92 to 100 AD, possibly up to 47 years that he reigns, when he dies, it's the last of the line of that long line of corrupt and decayed kings. And the contrast is fascinating when you think about it because, you know, here's Agrippa at the the height. Well, actually, he gets stronger even after this. But here's Agrippa and Paul, who's getting older, um, and Paul also has no children. But unlike Agrippa, Paul will be faithful to the vision that Jesus has given him to the end. And he will leave a spiritual legacy of faithful children of God that will go on through the ages. And we see just a word from Acts chapter 24 and verse 19 that that Paul says, as he sees and speaks with Agrippa, he says, So then, King, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. And he continues to appeal and to tell his story, especially to Agrippa, the one who knows so much about the Messiah. And in verse 27, when he can see that Agrippa is gripped by the story, he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And it's here we get those famous words. The King James says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian probably doesn't read quite like that. It's more Agrippa throwing a question back at Paul. You know, do you think that you could make me a Christian in this moment? And of course, Paul wants that. Of all things, this is what Paul wants for Agrippa. Imagine if that had happened. This is not Paul seeking to escape prison. This is Paul seeking to free Agrippa from his own personal prison of spiritual corruption. But Paul has appealed to Caesar. Why did he appeal to Caesar? Well, really, the bottom line is, just as he has presented the gospel to Agrippa, he wants to present it to Caesar. Go to the most powerful man of the most powerful empire in the world. He has been waiting for two years. He's not going to find justice in Jerusalem. He wants to testify before Caesar in Rome, as has been prophesied. The time is right. 
To Caesar he is appealed and to Caesar he must go. So while Paul is here in captivity in chains, he is really free. He's free to speak the truth. He is free to serve God. He is free to be who God intended him to be. Felix, Festus, Agrippa, they are immensely wealthy and powerful, but they are captive to fear and sin. They are bound by their decisions that, that have given them all that they thought they want, but it's all about fear and lust and corruption and power. So what do we learn? What happens if we end up in a situation where we have opportunity to speak the truth to power? And there's just four quick things that I now want to bring home and, and ask you to reflect on as you think about these passages. So number one, truth has power. When you look at Paul here, when he speaks the truth, men of power, listen, don't be intimidated by a person's power, reputation or title. Keep it simple. Speak the truth that has power. The second thing we see is that Paul seeks to do good for the powerful person. He sees beyond the pomp and ceremony. And often powerful people are bound in a prison of their own making and are fearful of losing power, influence and wealth. Speak the truth to their needs. And even if they don't change or don't change immediately, they will want to know more. Number three, don't resent their reluctance to do justice. If you get resentful, you will just get bent out of shape and angry and you'll achieve nothing. Find ways to use your time and energy constructively. And then finally, the thing we have to remember is that wherever we find ourselves in whatever circumstance, it may not be that God has caused that, but maybe in that moment, it's God's plan to use you right where you are. So let's be like Paul. Let's speak truth to power when the moment arises and be free in Jesus, no matter our circumstances. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this story, ongoing story of Paul in the book of Acts. It is truly amazing to, to see the way you work and to see how you work through a prisoner to, to seek to change the lives of powerful men. And Lord, as the story goes on from here and Paul goes on to Caesar, we continue to see your working. And we know today that you're working in our life and you seek to work through the moments in time where we find ourselves, whether it's in good circumstance or difficult circumstances. And may we trust in Jesus and may you work through us, no matter wherever and whenever we find ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen.